Lit podcast brought to you by the Children's Book Council. I'm Laura Peraza, and I always wanted to be an explorer, so diving into books and history is the closest I can get. I'm here joined by John. Hi, I'm John McCormick. Uh, I have a thirst for knowledge, and I'm so excited to have Laura educate me on some awesome things in literature history with this podcast, where we're finding the fun in history by trying to figure out what makes history lit. Fun. Okay, so today uh, we have a great topic, which is horror. And in this case, John is much more knowledgeable than I, but I did my homework and I found out a few things about uh, the horror genre. We can go back to 1001 Nights. Like it can go back that far, 8th to 10th century in the Middle East. Then it goes to Gulliver's stories and voyages and Mary Shelley. But before we get to Mary Shelley and Frankenstein, we first must stop at the Enlightenment. So in the Enlightenment time, like during those times, it was all about building a society in a better way. And all of this came with rationality. It was the rationalism movement. And with any movement that happens in history, there's always a whiplash. Like as soon as something and people get fed up about it, they go to the other extreme. And that side was the romance movement which uh, brought with it a lot of stories that were more fictional and popular and fantastical. Within that, we find the lovely Gothic literature movement, which, you know, late 18th century. And this is where they thought romance movement in general wasn't taking it far enough. So they took it one step further with mystery and terror. And at the beginning, it was settings and situations until it came more towards the psychological side of things. So actually, the novel that is considered the first Gothic novel is by Horace Walpole. It's called The Castle of Otranto. And this one uh, used a lot of secret passages, trap doors. There were pe pictures moving on the walls, things that we still to this day look at and see in the literary horror genre. Near that time, we also find the wonderful Aunt Ratcliffe's uh, Mysteries of Udolpho. And in this one, she took it one step further with supernatural terrors in a gloomy castle. So she took that setting and then just gave us these archetypal, now archetypal, uh, gothic elements. Highlighting these two were the precursors for Bram Stoker and Al Edgar Allan Poe and Robert Louis Stevenson and Mary Shelley and all of them. And there's a fascinating story that that we have about Frankenstein. Picture it. France, 1816, Lake Geneva. Lake Geneva. Mm -hmm. Mary Shelley, Percy Shelley, uh, Lord Byron, and Dr. John Polidori went on a three-day retreat. And I think, someone, I think someone named Claire Claremont. Fun fact, Mary I love Shelley's it. Mary Shelley's stepsister. I was think she, she was her stepsister. I don't know, but like she went and there were some yeah. like romantic behind the scenes things going Happening. on with like different yeah different like settings yeah well they they were very liberal like these these literary groups in those days like sexuality was one of the ways that they were expressing their I views think she's, i think she fancied herself some lord byron like a lot of the the air the the people of the time because yeah. lord byron is like Oh, he was a celebrity. Like people, like well, ladies were fangirling. There's, there's oh, yeah. actual fangirling, if you will, letters to <laughs> to Lord Byron. Like they were just swooning. Just like, a he 19th was, yeah. century Brad Pitt. Oh, just... absolutely. Yes. And no. This... John Palladori was his doctor. Okay, so um, fun coming fact. back to this, this is absolutely fun fact. So all of these very interesting people gathered to tell ghost stories, and they started challenging each other to to write one right and mary shelley's challenge actually ended up in a little known book called frankenstein small tiny small little book. tiny yeah. not did not change the face of literature no. at all at all i mean with this book clearly inconsequential yeah. uh she warns of the dangers of science of the lack of moral direction she touches on isolation on the importance of family like all these deep-seated issues that were not easily talked about right 
And we go back to, a, I mean, great, great book. Thank you, Madam Shelley. And we go back to Dr. Polidori's book. He also wrote one of the stories and it was the vampire. And his main, main character was a vampire, right? And it had some similarities to Lord Byron, I'm told. A little bit. Right? A little bit. Mm. A, a little too close to where Lord Byron sort of kicked him out of his circle, which sent Polidori into a deep, this like deep, deep depression. Because he <gasps> he promised it he he it had nothing to do with Lord Byron it was just how they came up with it and that this was just the character he came up with and it 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 really took a toll on Polidori's life and eventually took his life. Oh, that's so sad. Yeah, it was a very sad time, and it was just and it's because these people were telling ghost, ghost stories. stories. So like, Lord Byron was reading ghost stories of the time when they were all at this dinner. Mm -hmm. And then he challenged everyone to write a better ghost story. Oh, and this so just became. And it became Frankenstein. It became the vampire. Right. It became like, there's a bunch of like weird stories right. that like Percy Shelley ended up having like these like vivid nightmares because of these ghost stories. Oh, that's crazy. And imagine yeah. there were people like saying like, I mean, it was poor Dr. Polidori's own like ending, but you know, it elevated Mary Shelley. And then yeah. I didn't know Percy was having all of these things, even though people at the beginning doubted that Mary had actually written this. They said <laughs> that it had been Percy and she was just, it's like, guys, the guy was having nightmares. It was like a conversation like that started, I think Frankenstein, if I'm right, the conversation started between Palidori and Percy Shelley, and then Mary Shelley and Percy Shelley had a conversation about it, and then she mm -hmm. wrote it. Like and it this was like, is how, yeah. And it was all just because of this one random weekend getaway. Yeah. I, I want I want some inspiration. Yeah, <laughs> weekend right. getaways like that. Go to a beautiful, <laughs> like, gothic castle. I mean, I would not mind a villain, yeah. Lake Geneva. Like Lake that's... Geneva, yeah absolutely fine i'll sacrifice my weekend yeah like it's absolutely okay yeah i'll, I'll be there I'll, I'll, I'll buy the plane tickets it's fine <laughs> perfect i love it um okay so coming back to the story so at that time yes i mean we speak of books but in in those days we also need to remember that books one weren't that affordable it was it was uh, a privilege kind of thing so people what they did was like their version of tv and movies was serialized short stories and there were like a, a lot of them I mean we always think or most of us think of Charles Dickens as like that serialized author and then they were gathered into book form but in the in the beginning of the of the 1800s and 1830s the Penny Dreadfuls became a, a mass hit and popular you know they were just cheap paper they costed a penny hence the name but they basically shaped literary horror. They they differed a little bit from gothic literature as like the books because these stories were crafted in more realistic settings. So it wasn't the castles of, of Dracula, but it was more what people would find, which was honestly, like at least to me, a lot more terrifying because like you can see yourself in this and like some of these stories we still to this day know like Sweeney Todd and Barney Vampire and Spring Hill Jack like mm -hmm. these are settings and they are quite scary I mean you go to these people you go to the barber <laughs> then and, you don't come out and these penny, the penny dreadfuls of the time too like these created a frenzy so like penny dreadfuls are kind of like what how we look at modern video games like they're shaping mm -hmm. the youth they're really like they're messing with the kids brains they're and they started becoming really taboo oh i love that mm -hmm. and this is a recurring theme because i'm going to come back to that like this yeah. with with this genre i know with many others but at least right now here in in horror I'm going to make a parenthesis here because we need to remember that horror or gothic literature didn't come out by itself like at the same time we have we still have romance literature we have some sci-fi and hd wells and all of like all of these movements are happening almost in parallel and they're they're being enriched by each other they're speaking and there's so many stories that actually like toe the line very very thinly 
And all of these have that recurring theme that you're mentioning. Like, it's like, is it corrupting the youth? And like, what is happening? And how, what is it doing to kids' minds? Yeah. Which is how, kind how of, are we shaping? Yeah. I it, mean, it's, it, it's hilarious because, I mean, if we go back to real fairy tales, <laughs> like the ones that the Brothers Grimm actually like gathered, these were scary and they Wait, were scary for a reason. You mean th- they existed before Disney? I know, right? Shocking. Oh, oh my god. Shocking. Did I just did I just blow your mind? <laughs> my world's changed. Right. There you it's go. a it's just, a whole new world. It's a whole new world. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, these stories again just traumatizing, but there was a point to all of this. Like the point at least in yeah. with the fairy tales was to warn children of the dangers of the world. And if they're prepared and and know what's coming. They won't be duped, yeah. which is kind of the opposite view that we're having right now. But that's another story. Okay, coming back, right? So 18th, 1800s, this is the 19th century, and penny dress falls are super popular. That doesn't mean that literature itself hasn't been walking a little bit as well. And I think before, if you remember, we were speaking of it started with settings and then it moved into the psychological and the philosophical. And this is where novels like uh, The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde come in by Robert Louis Stevenson and The Picture of Dorian Gray by Oscar Wilde. So these actually brought philosophy into these stories. Like you had to dig deeper and it was telling you a different story and making you wonder what are the dangers of life everlasting, of beauty and just putting beauty on top of everything or putting intellect on top of everything. Good versus evil. Power, exactly. And and it's so much easier sometimes to put these type of themes and explore them in stories like these. So anyway, so for the 20th, it continues, like things as always evolve. And they had from actual literature to comics like horror comics and there's the amazing tales from the crypt which in all fairness 1950 1955 wasn't quite born yet but i did remember the later hbo show which you know like just makes you realize like the depth of of where these things come from and how these themes keep coming back and they keep being reused right right horror for me at its heart um it's it's stories that focus on creating like i mean a feeling of fear obviously like we we get these stories that allow room to express what would otherwise really not be allowed like you get to talk about things that are happening you get to talk about some of these deeper manifestations that we look at the real world and how do we how do we move forward like we look at good versus evil we look at manifestations on death and terror and loneliness and isolationism and like we get all of these in a horror setting and it can allow us to explore fear in a safer place so what horror is a is a genre at least for me it's it's the thematic navigation of the macabre and you find meaning in everyday life a world where reason and madness coexist which opens up a window to the soul so like you're getting a lot of these personal feelings and you get to feel connected to a story while also being a little bit scared you know like right well you 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 told me about like your connection with with neil gaiman and stephen king and all of like that to you like how did it affect you right and and a lot of that like so like neil gaiman I I read Sandman when I was in high school and like it really opened up my imagination but like it also I I was an only child I did I like a lot of times and I moved around a lot as a kid so like a lot of times if I felt lonely like I had my books and like we'll get to some of them later like R.L. Stein, Neil Gaiman, Stephen King these creators and and artists really showed me like it's it's okay the showcase of like the deepest and darkest impulses and it, it can be frightening. It can be exciting. It can be essential. It can be hopeful. It can be all these things. And it's just horror literature and early horror literature. It's just so fascinating. And like, um, I'm a huge movie fan. 
So like seeing like how modern cinematic horror has like always taken the roots of like some of the these older horror literature and like it's taken the roots of its predecessors and it's created I mean for me it's created just like fresh scares for like future like all the future generations so like I grew up in the watching all those like meta 90s horror movies Mm -hmm. so like scream I know what you did last summer oh yeah I mean even you get into like scary movie which is Uh, scream good yeah right I, I love what horror is able to do right but I and I think it comes back to what you were saying it's it's the themes it's the fear which is constant like we as humans have that fear and we have these feelings emotions empathy and it doesn't matter if it's a vampire or if it's the fear of going outside like whatever your level or where it's coming from you can relate to these stories and I mean there's a reason we keep making Frankenstein over and over and vampires and we reinvent them themes are always there and they're so inherently human that it's kind of like we have window dressing and that window dressing is delightful and it's beautiful and we want to see it and we want to see how all of these different people interpret that but underneath there's that strength that you were speaking of that that fear that just like like anyone any one of us humans can identify with and and go with it right i think yeah at the end of the day too it's it's fun like it's kind of it's fun to be scared right like yeah it's fun to push your limits it's fun to push see like toe the line of like what is scary how what your levels are what you're comfortable with Mm. well it teaches you to be brave teaches you to be brave and then like you get movies like halloween and nightmare on elm street and and like a lot of these friday the 13th like a lot of these like camp slashers right they're fun like they're they're meant to scare they're meant to be fun they're meant to but they also have have things they're saying yeah we have we have i've come across this uh beasts and beauty book by soman chainani recently and it is about that it's about those like just stories and they grip you and they're engaging but they're fun like you're just enjoying yourself while being slightly scared and being Mm -hmm. slight like you're just delving into magic and like there's some romance and but it's just it's fun because you're scared you can relate to those characters so at least for me like growing up you can sort of track my love of horror from from my early ages and like how I influenced like me as a person so I remember as a kid I was terrified of the twilight zone just absolutely but I loved it mm-hmm. and and I and Twilight Zone to this day is one of my favorite just creations but I there's two episodes in particular that like I remember watching as a kid and I just they terrified me they scared me and it, it, I think it was just the manifestations of like what they were doing mm-hmm. so there was one episode called Mirror Image and it's like this woman in a train station and she keeps going to the to the ticket agent and she's like, hey, can I have this thing? And the ticket agent will be like, you just asked me this three minutes ago. And she's like, no, I didn't. And like, it's this par- and it's this parallel universe right. like, that's overlapping. And that for some reason terrified me that someone could just come in and take my place. Or I, I really got into at least a little bit more in my teenage years. There's an episode called Five Characters in Search of an Exit. Mm-hmm. And it's five characters and they're trying to figure out a way out of this cylinder. Like like um, a escape room type situation? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And they're all trying to figure out a way and then you find out that they're all dolls inside of a trash oh. can. Oh God, this is evil Toy Story. <laughs> so, well, but they think they're real. So like a lot of it, I'm pretty sure it's an adaptation of a short story that's an adaptation of Jean-Paul Sartre's No Exit. Oh. So it's ex- existentialism at its core. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And like, that's what I find. So like, I find just sort of the existential like philosophies like to mm-hmm. be so interesting. And like, you deal with a lot of that in horror. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree. I think it, again, it makes you look at yourself in a different way and learn and you don't know how or when 
you end up applying this because like you realize okay fine this is this that's the point of stories and like what we tell ourselves things right like we yeah. we learn and and we enjoy bringing that to life and it's usually nice when you don't have to learn by yourself but you can just yeah. take the lesson from someone else. Yeah. Like, I don't know, did you ever read sandman like going back to neil gaiman yes yes just that that in terms of horror for for reading was one of my early early just loves i well in that case i love it for two reasons which i think many of these that we have mentioned bring to it which is not just the words but the images so i think images and horror are so important even if it's description like the literature has to be very descriptive to bring that sense of of atmosphere mm -hmm. exactly and And that's what that book has visceral the visceral horror in sandman just like some of it's unmatched and just it's so creepy and weird and scary and it deals with a lot of really heavy philosophical topics. Mm-hmm. I find that they capture the essence of what they were trying to show. I mean, they're trying to show these beings who are who are beyond gods. You know, like they're they're beyond time. They're beyond, and they're the essence of, of you know dream and nightmares and like desire, desire. Yeah, and it's the anti-Greek mythology version of this. Like yeah. Greek mythology presented the gods as very human and they had these flaws and like you could relate to them in a way. But Neil Gaiman with Sandman has presented a world that is very human, but at the same time, very alien. Like we're yeah. really not close yeah. to these. It's a very celestial yeah. approach to yes. these characters. Exactly. And what might seem creepy or horrible or scary for us for them is just normal so it's kind of like showing again we go back to to what might be scary for you it's not scary for me or what might produce fear in one person might not necessarily or might just be enjoyment for the other like there's always the lines and there's always the different sides to things and he manages to show and bring you in to experience all the multiple sides of it and a lot of it is like what happens when this omnipotent being Mm. is like on a mission for something like that's a very scary process yeah trying to track down these like these totems it's terrifying Um, it really is yeah and then going back to the way i view horror it's just like there were there were periods of time in which i found different horror creators um so neil gaiman was very much how what i equate with my teenage years Mm -hmm. but like twilight zone is sort of the bridge of like kid to teenage like i found it when i was young but then like got more and more comfortable and like you go to disney and you do tower of terror oh my god yes Which i is hate a- towers oh i love it i do it because it's because twilight it's twilight zone. related i mean the, but honestly the the ride is fun and that's fine but to me, it's always been the story, like the way they capture that hotel. And yeah. I was watching these um, Disney Plus as a thing, and they speak of their of their rides. And in this one, they had to recreate the entire thing because there wasn't a Twilight Zone story that matched this one or matched what they needed to do. So they recreated and they managed to get the tone very, very yeah. correct. And... Um, what's his name so the presenter like unfortunately had passed away by the time they actually created the ride so they had to recreate and piece together thank you recreate and piece together his voice it was and for the younger audience this is the original black mirror like this is all you need to know and so scary it so weird and creepy Mm. and and i mean there's so many adaptations in today's horror that like take premises mm-hmm. off of twilight zone episodes yeah well because horror i mean you we keep mentioning it horror has no fear in copying and reinventing right. like it's part of what that's but, how it started but staying and it, original continue. yes yeah. absolutely yeah it's a new reinterpretation of right. of things that have been told in one way or another I mean, some modern horror has gotten so meta that like 
at some point it just it's gonna we're just gonna recreate picture for picture the same thing like i'm constantly surprised that the screen movies can stay as good as they have with as meta as they are it's also there's there's that line where it's kind of making fun of the genre itself while mm. at the same time bringing you some scares and a little bit of fear it's, it's fun that, that brings me to a point where I, I think there is something really interesting in horror that like if you are interested in these themes there is a type of horror for everybody mm-hmm some people might not be into haunted house things some people might not be into possession or even cerebral like there there's something for everybody like i'm not super into gore horror like your texas chainsaw is your saw yeah well but then this is why your love of goosebumps and and that right. side of yes so rl stein shaped my childhood in ways that I haven't yet figured out like I'm, I'm 31 now. Um, and I remember going to the scholastic book fair being like six or seven and my parents like, Oh, you want to read here? Just buy whatever, buy whatever this is. And I remember buying a book from Arl Stein and I can remember the picture this day because it's like skeletons in a grill. And like, it's a polar, it's a picture of them. And it, the book's called Say Cheese and Die. And it's about an evil camera that like, if you take a picture, it shows you like something bad that's going to happen to you. Mm-hmm. And I remember, like, I was like six and this is what I was reading. And I remember just loving it and being so scared. It, and a lot of goosebumps for me, like I can close my eyes and just like picture the book covers mm-hmm. just because it meant so much well and those those covers and the stories they were and they are so great i mean they're eye-catching they're very literal in Mm. in a lot of ways which makes it funny the haunted mask (laughs) and it's It's just about a kid who puts a mask on and then can't take it off but it's haunted and it's great i love it and also they're short you can just go through them and kind of like dive into the story and come back out and enjoy it multiple times, which is, it's very penny dreadful of them. They don't cost yes. a penny, sadly. I mean, good for Arla Stein, he needs his money, but. Um, this was the 90s though, so yeah. it was like, it was closer. Yeah, <laughs> we could still buy more books. It's, it's I still just love that it was like, hey, you know what we should give the youth of America? Nightmares. Yes. Scare them all. I, I love amusement parks, right? Mm-hmm. Like I from Florida, go to Disney, go to Universal, all the all that jazz. And there was one called Well or One Day at Horrorland. And it was about a evil amusement park. And yeah. I absolutely loved it. And I was terrified of amusement parks for a minute. So okay, before we close out, we people want to know. Yes. Favorite horror graphic novels. Prepare your so, pens. Great book yes. list. Right here. I um <laughs> little little backstory is I I am very into just graphic novels, comics in general. I mm-hmm. I work and I work in a comic book store. So graphic novels are something near and dear. And I, I find them the educational value of comic books in general, like for early readers, for middle readers, for for any type of reader, like comic books and graphic novels are fun. And they're sometimes like we're all busy adults like we sometimes we also just don't have time to like dive into a full book and not a lot of us have the the chance to listen to audiobooks so like graphic novels are a really good way to get like bite-sized horror so here we go um there's a book called specter inspectors by boom studios that i absolutely adored it's like those true those true crime ghosts like haunted house shows like the people that go into the haunted house oh, to yeah, like, yeah. find the ghost that's uh-huh. it's about this like teenagers or like maybe young adults and they go into they're trying to like crack this haunted house like figure Mm -hmm. out the ghost and the poltergeist um and it's very inclusive it's really fun um i love that book mason mooney from flying eye is fantastic (gasps) yes it's just it's the trim size is great the art is great i that book is fun Um, garlic the vampire by brie paulson it's really cute if you want like cute spooky mooncakes is there's a book called mooncakes that's really good also really inclusive there's a book um there's a little graphic novel like for like burgeoning readers called the creeps 
Oh, it's really, really cute. Oh, if you need to get into it, I love it. Um, some a little bit of YA horror, sort mm-hmm. of like YA, a little bit closer to mature. Uh, something is killing the children. It's all the rage with like the comic book community because it's like been optioned and there's a lot of speculator culture to it. But it's very cool. Think it's like a li- it's very eighties. Like it kind of feels a little bit like Stranger Things, but then it has this mm-hmm. this character, this monster hunter, um, by the name of Erica Slaughter, and she is just awesome. Like for oh. for a protagonist, like she's really cool, and it starts getting into the or like this sort of order that trained these monster hunters and you start getting into really rich backstory and it's really cool oh i love that i i have i have one that touches on this as well dead flip by sarah farzan stranger things vibes and it's halloween 1990s yeah and then a book that might be my favorite comic book and like it's it's not as horror and it's not for kids um it's like later later teen like 16 plus so monstrous by marjorie Liu and sauna takeda it looks at the socioeconomic and socio-political fallouts of war does it in a way that is just sauna takeda's art the is so so visceral it's so so good but it's hopeful it's horrific it's scary it's beautiful it's sad it's tragic it's funny it gives you everything but it gives it to you in like it, it, it's very fantastical like the world building in this is so so good mm-hmm. it, it teeters on not being super horror like like the rest of the books but like you really get some horror aspects in it with just how war-torn it is it's, it's what we talked about it's all the levels it, as we've been noticing horror is not just horror by itself like there's always something attached like it yes it is the fear but there's always a story or a different like what you said like some like their psychological thrillers some people prefer the gore or the monsters or like we all have our little corner that cute horror like yeah i have a bunch of like little posters of like little so i i have i it's san diego comic-con this year i got um it's like a 10 by 10 screen print and it's two ghosts. It's like a uh, it's like a parent ghost and a baby ghost. And instead of reading ghost stories, they're reading people stories. Yes. And it's just like the most endearing. But it, like it's perfect for for spooky season. Well, yeah. yeah. Well, and it's the whole premise of like the Adams family and this whole yeah. side, even like Hotel Transylvania. Like they, the monsters, if you will, are living their normal lives. Yeah. And for them, the other is us. We're the reciprocal. Exactly. So they're scared of us and like how our yeah. ways, our ways of living and we're infringing upon the their world. territory. Yeah, exactly. I love that you got to go to San Diego Comic Con this yes. year, right? With the yeah, to do the the panels with the graphic novel committee. That was that was fantastic. Oh, I love it. Hit hint yeah. plug, guys. Go check these out. They're awesome. I will say, and this just popped in my head, another really fun horror graphic novel, The Haunted Mansion has a comic book series that is i i'm a i'm a really big haunted mansion fan it's so fun it's 999 happy haunts like what what more can go wrong yeah um but the book itself the comic itself is just so fun it's so cute it has so many different little tributes and easter eggs for the both world and land Mm -hmm. so like if you're a fan of the ride itself it's just, it's the story of a kid going into the haunted mansion, but like there's so many fun references to just haunted mansion pop culture. Oh, I love it. I love oh, it. I so love it. Uh, my fiance and I uh, in 2018 was the 50th anniversary in Disneyland. Mm-hmm. They shut down the park or they opened the park from one to 4 a.m. And it was like this ticketed event. And so we're from Florida. We're from, we're from, we have Disney World in our backyard, but we flew to LA to go to this event. That absolutely reasonable. Yes. And it was, good it call. was, it was magical. It was just so fun. They did this whole presentation, this whole like countdown, a live performances, photo ops that you normally don't get. The, the ride was open. There was merch. It, and oh. it was like, and it was, two in the morning so like mm-hmm. they had the that's like the spookiest atmosphere oh i love that uh, it was it was magical well with that lovely story and haunted mansion comics 
I think we can close our yeah. history's lid on horror. It's I've learned a lot. It horror wasn't one of my growing up genres. I have to say I was a scaredy cat for sure. But for me, and I later found this out, I did and I kept picking up the psychological side. So like that philosophical and like the Dorian Gray's. Just nowadays we have so many subgenres and interest. Even even they made horror for families, like the Munsters, the Adams family. Yeah. And this is where that unity, like the lanes of the genres, when they meet, it's so important. And that's what you're finding so enriching right now when you're just finding new ways to look at horror. And and even something we haven't really touched on, which we will touch on in a future episode, and especially pertaining to Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, it's science fiction. So a lot of horror, and we haven't really touched on a lot of science fiction, but science fiction can be horror and horror can be science fiction. So like those two share a lot of similar qualities, but that's something we'll touch on in another episode. So that's where uh, we invite you to come back next episode for more journeys into book history. Uh, This is History is Lit podcast, and it was brought to you by the Children's Book Council. You can find out more about these topics and many more at cbcbooks.org slash history is lit. Bye. Bye.